All right, guys, we're coming at you live from the back of our taxi on the way back to the airport after a, what would you say, Piper, a very eventful New York Toy Fair 2020? So tired. So much tired. Lots of things. We just wanted to record this. Apologize for the audio, but it is what it is. Uh, I think I, I guess we'll do this as the intro to our interview. We had a very great interview with uh, Truck from 100% Soft, and... It was uh, pretty eye-opening from a small business perspective, don't you think? I I really enjoyed the fact that we got to get a little bit of the the inside deets on what he goes through when developing his pins and his toy. It's very I don't know I didn't uh, I got a lot more out of it than I thought uh, we would. Yeah, me too. It was uh, interesting to see how somebody goes through the design process. And for people like us that would be ever interested in doing something like making a vinyl figure, you know, doing pins or any collectibles, it was a good uh, view of what is the, what's the word from design to production. Inception to production. Yes. And we... I spent a little time with Truck. That was a good time. We also stopped by the Funko booth. Uh, That was one of the first places we went. I was I was excited about some of the products they have uh, this year. Some of the new stuff too uh, looked really good when you were there. The pop albums. That is something. I I don't think people looking at the picture. It just looks like okay. Here's a big box with just a pop in it. That's kind of like sitting off to the side. But once you actually break down what it is, the fact that they're recreating album artworks with pops and then providing you with a hard plastic case, just like a hard stack that's mountable on your wall, that is awesome. And the fact that it's going to be $15 is crazy. In case you didn't know that, it's only going to be $15. Yeah, I was surprised at that too. Initially, the hard stack's 10 Yeah, exactly. Initially, when I looked at it and we were talking with Sully, I was surprised because he gave guess. And I guess 15 Mine but was 20. I only thought that because I didn't know that there was a hard stack in there. Yeah. And, I and once either. I saw that, I was like, wow, that's an amazing pri- price point. And for this album, for the Biggie album, it's pretty simple. So you could see how complicated they could go. You know, and I think they'll probably pick easier things to start with, or maybe to stick with. They'll be easier, but there's some really, really iconic album art that I think would translate really well to that. You think of stuff like from around that same era, like Nirvana, like the Nevermind album. I oh. doubt, I doubt they'll do a fully <laughs> nude baby on it, but still, I mean, stuff like that. There's certain things like some Guns N' Roses albums that would do really well. There's a lot of like 90s rap albums that would be perfect. There's just so much stuff that you could do with it. And uh, Sully's example was, you know, imagine Metallica's black album with the snake on the side. So it's just like, and that would that would be perfect. I think that's so cool. So there's a lot. I, I mean, they are trying really, really hard to be innovative. And I think that it's paying off. Yeah, and I also liked some of the smaller figures that they were doing. They're trying to get... To a younger audience with oh, like the, the nose picking, the, thing. the boogie, yeah, and monster the... thing, and just the fact that you have a finger and you have to, <laughs> you actually have to pick the figure out of the nose that's covered in slime. So that concept will really appeal to younger audiences. Because kids are gross. That's yeah, why. exactly. And also the, uh, I'm trying to think. All the pop candy. I wonder what that tastes like. Sully, we were talking like maybe it. Hopefully, it comes out like nerds yes. because that would be cool. Yeah, um, yeah. Sully was saying that uh, Funko actually bought a candy company so that they could produce that. So those are. It's, it's not just like oh, they're buying from some distributor overseas or even local. They are. They have their own candy company in house now that's developing that. So I'm guessing that that is going to be a doorway to a lot more uh, kind of edible things, and I think that's cool. Yeah, I agree. And then also the pop pins. You saw a huge expansion of those. I love the fact that they're going into that world with chases. And uh, they had a Chase Greedo out. I forget what the other figure was. I think it was a Batman, maybe. as Oh, it was, uh, it was a Joker. They had a Joker. They had a Loki. And they had a Greedo. Oh, the Loki was the gold one. Yeah, yeah the Loki so, gold. And, and he kind of showed us those. Those are really cool. They're very big pins. But the really neat thing is if you don't plan on wearing them as a pin... There's a, uh, a kickstand on them, like you would have on, like, on a picture frame. So you could pop that kickstand off and stand it on your desk or on your mantle or wherever. 
So there's multiple ways that those can be displayed. And he was also showing us that the boxes that they come in are the same height and width as a pop, well, but, half half, the width. but half the depth. Yeah. So you could actually take two of them and put them in a, uh, hard, in a uh, soft protector. So that way you can keep them dust free. So that's really, that's smart. Yeah, very smart. And then also Funko, that was a wrap on Funko. We'll go into more detail in our episode, but we just want to hit the high notes. Uh, then we did, uh, we talked to Figpin. Yep. Um, and, and some of their products that are up and coming look very good. We got a, a little bit of an early look at some things. Yeah, some things that we can't talk about, but hey. They look really good. They're going in the right direction. We also talked about the party so and uh, what that's going to be. So it seems like the party is going to be awesome. A great time for whoever it gets to go to that and experience their first Figpin fan party. Yay. And one of the big takeaways from them is uh, the fact that they, how well they interact with their fans, how well they're taking information that the audience and collectors give them and just interpreting that either through their app or through future products that they have. It, it was very, it was very surprising. They sat down with us and they were just like, tell us what you want, tell us what would be great. So we got to sit down with their, uh, their lead developer and we got to sit down with one of their sales guys and we got to kind of, unload and let them know kind of what we thought what they were doing great and what they needed to work on and we threw some ideas at them so we'll see uh, and hopefully we develop a good relationship with these guys yeah it was uh, pretty cool to let them know the things that we would like to change or the things that we love that they do and just their responsiveness to all of that and things that they may or may not be doing in the near future uh, then we stopped uh, today Sunday we hit a bunch of places up this morning we went to good smile company looked at some of their new figures we'll cover that in a, a, a youtube video and then some of the lines that are coming out in the near future you'll see all of this we'll be putting a bunch of it on the website we also talked to pokemon that Ooh, was really cool yeah i'm excited about us and working hopefully with pokemon company because I think there's a lot to be explored there. I know a lot of a lot of you listeners, uh, you guys are also trading card game collectors and players. So we've had some people asking us, you know, to start covering Pokemon, uh, and especially the card aspect of it, not just like the figures and and stuff like that. So I'm uh, I'm really excited to kind of play around in that world. Yeah, and and we also talked to a company called Made by Robots. Oh my gosh! Yeah, and they make awesome figures. You put a couple of those up in Discord. We'll put them out um, in Instagram. Yeah, they're too. on Instagram. Yeah, and as uh, you guys can see it, they're vinyl figures that look like they're knitted. Oh, yeah, like you know, you can go to a comic book convention and you'll have all these you know local artists that they do these hand knitted characters you know from different fandoms. You might see like. Doctor Who or, you know, Marvel or something like that. But these guys took that concept and they made it into a vinyl figure. Oh my gosh. You have to just you have to see these in person. They're so like they're heavy and they're so cool looking. They're definitely an out of box kind of thing. But yeah, they're up on our Instagram if you want to check those out. That's made by robots. Yeah, and get on that bandwagon early because it looks like they're going to be... He said they're blowing up. Yeah, very popular, and they're going to only get more and more licenses and be able to expand that product line. We'll, we'll show you those in the near future. And then also, uh, we ended the day pretty strong. At, uh, we stopped by Cryptozoic and looked at uh, some of the convention exclusives that are going to come out we for actually the saw, We saw all of the convention exclusives for this year. So uh, we'll have those. And we have some uh, information uh, we got from them that we're going to put out in an article. And, uh, and then uh, we're going to be hopefully working with those guys as well. So getting you guys some backstage behind the curtain access, hopefully. Yeah, and then uh, one of the other places as we close out here was Smisky. And that's the figure so that we opened on the live stream <laughs> the other day about... Uh, with the um, toilet the, the boys. Toy, uh, toilet boys, but they have bedroom. It, it's really cool. We'll get into that more, and hopefully get somebody on our podcast. We talked with those guys for a while, and it was it was a really eye opening conversation for smaller collectibles at a lower price point that are really unique. So I'm very anxious to be able to talk to you guys about that. But we'll go into all of that in detail both on our website and our upcoming episode. But uh, until then, I just want to leave you guys with the truck from 100% soft and we'll be back on our next episode next week so I'm Rick I'm Piper enjoy the interview bye
All right, this is Rick and Piper. Hey, what's up, guys? And we're coming at you live from Toy Fair New York 2020, and we are here, as promised, with truck, owner, operator, proprietor, anything you want to say for 100% soft. Hi, how are you? <laughs> we're doing great. <laughs> Excellent. And, and uh, one of the things that our followers have really pegged us on is do an interview with this guy. We love this new figure. Okay. The Is it little dumpster fire or is it just dumpster it's fire? It's just dumpster fire, but I mean, you know, I, a lot of people call it the little dumpster fire because it is little. <laughs> you know? So we saw two variants of it. There was like a green and a pink. Yeah. So what, uh, what was the, let's start with, what was the inspiration for that figure? Uh, the 2016 election. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, the term dumpster fire is not new, yeah. but you certainly saw it or heard it or read it a lot during that election cycle for whatever reason, you mm -hmm. know? And um, I, <clears throat> when, when I'm not doing my normal work, part of my other normal work is just drawing and creating stuff. And... Um, I, I drew a little dumpster fire because anytime I would read the news cycle and I would see something that was a dumpster fire, I need you know I wanted something to express it. <laughs> you had so, to get that out. Exactly. So it wasn't uncommon for me to be reading about something and then you know express disdain for it, and then I would post this GIF that I'd made of just a little cute dumpster that was on fire, and uh -huh. people seemed to really kind of respond to that, and so. You know, like as an as an independent creator, when mo when people start, when you can tell that people are paying attention to something more than others, you s like I sort of have to gauge like, well, what else can I do with this? You know, <laughs> so I made it into a an enamel pin because I do a lot of like pins, and yeah, accessories and stuff, and and that thing just became like one of my highest selling pins, uh, and I didn't really get it you know and, <laughs> and it's you know and i knew that you know like i knew that it would kind of resonate with people but you you never really know when something's gonna like click you know um and one thing that i started seeing is that like people were buying like five or ten or fifteen or twenty oh wow sometimes thirty of these pins wow. from my web store and i was like why are people doing that <laughs> Which is great. Like, I want them You're to do that. You're not going to complain that. about that, right? Yeah, I want them to do that. But it was just very strange because I, what, what are they doing with all those little dumpster fires? And so I'm not in the habit of doing this, but I, one guy ordered like 50. Oh, my gosh. And I emailed him, and I was like, hey, thanks for your order. Really cool. Um, I just wanted to ask you, though, like, what are you what are you doing with these? <laughs> <laughs> like, why do you need 50? And he was like, oh, man, I work at blank tech company, and we're all on this project that we call a dumpster fire. Oh, nice. And so I bought the t the pin for our whole team to wear in solidarity. Oh. And I was like, oh, okay. And so then I kind of started connecting the dots, and I started noticing that a lot of the people that are putting in those bulk orders work for, like, entertainment companies. Oh, cool. Tech companies, media companies. And I would end up, and then and then I would start seeing people tag me in photos of like their team wearing all these pins and everything. It was and so awesome. I thought it was so funny. And so I've had a long, like as long as I've worked professionally as an artist, I've I've always wanted to make toys just because toys are great. Right? Yes. And I love toys. And I, I, when I started in earnest as an artist, I interned under like a, a toy maker. And she really kind of walked me through what it was like to build and, and make and, and produce toys. And that was something I always wanted to do. Wanted to do, And I came close like time after time after time after time again. And, and for whatever reason, it never, it never worked out. But over the past couple of years, I've been thinking, I was like, well, like, if I have, like, a really good idea for a toy, like, I'm going to make a toy, you know? Exactly. And um, and actually, like, about a year ago, when I was at Toy Fair last year, um, I was hanging out with a friend of mine, and, and I was kind of taught, I was trying to figure out, like, what I, what I should be doing next, uh, because I had Comic-Con yeah. coming up in the summer, and um, it started, like, I, like when we were talking, it, it, 
I, I was like, well, like the dumpster fire is like my most popular thing I do. Like I should just make that into a toy. Uh huh. And so um, I worked with a 3D modeler, and they modeled the toy for me. And then I created it as a limited edition resin toy, and I brought it to San Diego Comic Con in 2019. And that is where people sort of like kind of went bananas for it. So that's kind of the history of it. So backing up, mm -hmm. that's a toy that resonates with people. And sure. it's interesting to see how what your initial idea was for that item and uh -huh. how it resonates with other people. Sure. Because we all know that we've all worked on a dumpster fire. We've always used that, yeah. that term, so that was really cool. But for sure. back to 100% soft. So uh -huh. how did 100% soft, where did that name come from? Uh, it's, it's, what I used, it's what I used to, it was an easy way for me to describe the kind of art I do. Because um, when, when people would ask me what kind of art I do without seeing it, they'd be like, well, it's like really cute and it like, you know, everybody, every, all the characters are like bubbly and, and everybody's like really soft, like they're 100% soft and like everybody, you know. Yeah. And so it just kind of, it, it ended up like the descriptor actually became the brand, you know what I mean? Oh, it, nice. That's yeah. awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hear the name Truck and then I hear 100% yeah. soft yeah, yeah. and I was like, well, well, yeah, well, yeah, Truck's <laughs> just my nickname. My real name is Evan. It's oh, yeah. <laughs> fine, fine Welsh name. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of your pins have sort mm. of that play on words. Yeah, sure. And, basically just like you said that translation from something that you see or something out there or yeah. just an idea that pops in your head yeah i mean like a lot of like most of if not all the things i do are born out of things that are personal to me whether things i like or things i hate or things <laughs> or kind of anything in between or you know kind of like you know i sort of have a little bit of an off-kilter sense of humor and so um, you know, I, I do like the idea of juxtaposing like really cute things with something that maybe isn't that cute, like a dumpster or a coffin or whatever it is, you know? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, I see a lot of the pins in there that, that have been turned to that. And it's, all, it's always cool to see sort of an interpretation of something that, that one, I like to see. And we love enamel pins. We love collectibles. Cool. Every, all of our followers do. So that was really awesome uh, to be able to do that. So one of the things that we, when we like to focus on small toy making companies mm -hmm. or companies in general what are some of the struggles like you said before we've actually known people in even ourselves we've gotten to the point where we're like hey we want to make something sure and you can never it seems like there's so much red tape around being able yes. to complete that yes. so what are some of the struggles that you've seen as you've sort of navigated from enamel pins to a vinyl collectible sure I do everything myself so when you do everything yourself it's a constant struggle of like making mistakes, stumbling around in the dark, and it's it's a crapshoot of just seeing what works and what doesn't. And when you're dealing with production um, on something that costs a lot of money, you have to be really careful about the choices you make or else you're going to be out a lot of money. Yeah, exactly. And so, like I said, when I first kind of started in earnest as an artist, you know, it's like when I would see someone that would make a toy, I would just be like, well, like, how, how did you do that? You know what I mean? <laughs> there, it seems like there's so many steps, you exactly. know? And I was really lucky, like I said, I interned under an artist who was able to, like, deconstruct and decompress that process for me. And she and her partner are the ones that kind of taught me, a, like, oh, like, we make resin toys. And I was like, oh, like, well, how do you do that? And they're like, we cast them ourselves. And I was like, oh, nice. whoa. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's, <laughs> that's crazy. And then yeah. I would watch how they did it. And I was just like, oh, my God, that's so much work. And so I, I did it a little bit. Uh -huh. I, like, had some characters and some designs I wanted to fool around with. And I did it. And it was a lot of work. And it was to be honest, like it was pretty overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, like after I did it the first time, I was like, oh, like this is how you do it. Like I know that that's how you do it. How, and all right, like how do you transition that moving forward? And, and honestly, like a big obstacle of it is money. Because um, if you like, you have kind of two routes to go about it. You can either self-produce, which is um, doable, but it's a huge personal investment and you're assuming all the responsibility and all the liability or you can partner with a company and you can let them handle all that logistics yeah but you're losing a piece of the pie exactly. and in some cases you're losing some of the control and 
So for years, I looked at vinyl toys and I'd be like, oh, like, I just need to, like, partner with someone to do it, you know? If I partner with someone to do it, then they're going to, like, hand, hold my hand all the way through it and everything will be fine, you know? But, like, there's a lot of, like you said, there's a lot of red tape that kind of goes along with that. And there's a lot of deals that end up don't happening because you know, they're not fair or, or nobody's happy or whatever. For whatever reason, it doesn't happen. And so I had years and years and years of, like, almost making a toy because I was relying on, um, I was relying on someone else to like realize that thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, and then what ended up happening for me is that like, after the dumpster fire kind of took off in San Diego, I had a lot of offers from different companies to like do this toy with me. And at a certain point I was like weighing all these offers and then I was kind of looking at it and I was like, you know what, dude, like, what if I did this myself? You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I've produced toys on my own. Like I've produced plush toys and like plush charms and stuff like that. So I have like production experience and I also have experience like, like I, before I was like a working artist, I was like a working graphic designer. So I have like, I have a lot of production experience. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, well, like what, what if I just do this myself? I have the money to do it. I believe in the product exactly. and like, let's just see what happens. You know what I mean? And so I took a big risk doing it, which doesn't always pay off. But in this case, like I tried to be tactical about the decisions I made. So I wasn't sinking money into something just because I wanted to see how it did. You know, I tested the market in San Diego with that limited edition resin thing and people really, really scrambled to get that. So I was like, you know what, dude? Like, I think this could be okay. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. And so that's where I'm at. I'm self-producing this stuff, which is amazing and fun. But man, it's like a lot of work. It's, <laughs> it's a lot of logistics. It's a lot of emailing. It's a lot of like, it's a lot of managing um, every, every part of it that has nothing to do with drawing. Yeah, you know I mean? <laughs> exactly. And so like, and that's hard, you oh, know? Yeah, and oh, so, yeah. and so, it, you know, I would say like, if anybody's trying to do that, they need to really look at their expectations of like what this thing looks like, because it's a lot of work and you don't always know if there's a payoff. And that's probably why it took me 10 years to make my first vinyl toy. That's great. That's a great segue into what I was going to say is that length of time. Yeah. I think a lot of people's expectations are, hey, we can just create something yeah. and it's just going to be all the dominoes are going to fall into one place, but yeah. they don't realize for sure. what's behind it. Because trust me, I've had ideas for toys before and I've been like, I'm going to make this toy. And then I would like price it out and stuff. And then I'm like, I'm going to make this toy, you know, and then, I, <laughs> and then I'd get like closer and closer. And then, and then I'd be like, I don't know if I should make this toy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, and you know, honestly, like you do have to like take the plunge at a certain point, but you know, it's like, I'm, I've worked in this industry long enough. Uh, and struggled long enough to know that like I can't just like at this point in my life and my career I can't be blindly just jumping into the ocean and being like well whatever we'll yeah. see what happens you know <laughs> and so you know like I started small and I gauged interest and then I acted on that interest you know yeah. what I mean and that doesn't always work out that way but like in this case it did which is great yeah and I think that you, you said it right there was the demand was already there for mm -hmm. that product sure. and it was pure and simple execution and staying with it what's in the future for 100% self what are you looking at down the road well um, there's a lot more dumpster fire stuff <laughs> uh, and um, I mean like I'm just trying to figure I am in a constant state of just trying to figure out how to like realize any of the weird dumb ideas I have you know what I mean <laughs> yeah and whether that's as a toy or like animation or like more accessories or whatever you know what I mean like I've been pretty fortunate to be able to like realize a lot of the dumb ideas I have and people like them and so I'm gonna keep trying to do that you know when we were walking uh, down here about something that you did and uh, Apple kind of did a feature mm -hmm. on it but that was the uh, would you say the um, animated stickers mm -hmm. and and what all were those and and uh, the inspiration behind that how did that take yeah effect? so uh, I I I work with um, a lot of movie studios and they hire me to draw really cute versions of their characters doing stuff as like little animated stickers and so you can buy animated sticker packs from Star Wars and Marvel and Disney and all kinds of other places that all have like my version of their characters kind of dancing around and like doing stuff and so um, and I've, I've, I've been lucky to work with a lot of those studios for five or six years now doing that kind of stuff. 
does that all help your design process? All of that for was sure. a learning process for, for that? sure, for sure. Because as I started out as an artist, because I have I have a very specific aesthetic. In order to kind of like really master my aesthetic, I had a pretty tiny box that I worked in where like I had very specific rules of, of the type of design I did with my characters or, or the art I did. And as I've grown as an artist, that box has gotten bigger and bigger. And so when I started out, I had a specific way I drew people and I had a specific way that I drew people doing things. And then as I, uh, as I started working with more and more companies and they had more and more needs from me, I would have to figure out ways to adapt my style to their needs, which then made my style start growing more organically. Oh, yeah. And so what started out as something kind of rigid, like I still have constraints and I still have a box that I play in, but it's a lot bigger now. And it allows me to, it allows me a little bit more freedom to have a little bit more fun and, and do bigger and cooler things. And so some of those clients like Lucasfilm or Marvel or whoever, um, they've helped push me in, in that direction of just trying to like, you know, because I've had to look at characters and be like, okay, how do I take um, like Darth Maul and like make him cute? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And what does that look like? You know, and that means I have to break some of the rules that I've set. Yeah. And uh, which, but then that that, I, that doesn't actually mean I'm breaking them. It just means I'm like creating a new set of rules. You yeah, know? and you're growing. I exactly. Mean, as an yeah, artist too, for so sure. I was curious about. So let's say you decide you're going to do like a new color variant of you know dumpster fire. Yes. What is the time frame it takes from? Okay, here's my concept of how I'm going to change it to when you actually get a final product to get it to ship out. Like, what does that look like? Well, if it's a pretty easy variant like, like a colorways variant or something like that yeah, yeah yeah if it's a pretty easy color switch um it's actually not that long it's like maybe like one to two months okay um because they have that mold and all they really need to do is some color switches you know what i mean if it starts getting a little bit more exotic yeah um then it could be anything it could be a little bit longer generally like the time frame is like pretty quick relatively speaking but like relative i mean like two months might sound like a long time for people you know what I mean? But um, in the grand scheme of 10 years, exactly, two months is time. Exactly, yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's cool. As we move closer, do you have plans for any convention exclusives or things along those lines that you do or companies that you're going to work with in the future? Yes. So next Saturday, the 29th, leap year, <laughs> uh, I'm, ha I'm having a launch party for the Dumpster Fire toy, like a kind of a proper release party. And that's going to be a Japan, LA, Little Tokyo in Los Angeles. And I'll be bringing the classic green dumpster there. And then I'll be debuting um, a new colorway, which is like the purple and pink one that you saw with like yeah. the blue flame. Yes. And that's an exclusive to that event. And then uh, I'll be bringing another exclusive to Comic-Con this year. And then there's a few other exclusives that I can't talk about yet that, that will be with some other people. But um, you'll be seeing those pretty soon, too. So that's, a, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, news definitely. I did have a question. I know that... Um, Tenacious Collective, I know that you uh, have some of your items up on there. Uh, how do you work with them? Because I know, we've, we've, do, you, do they just distribute for you or? Uh, I have a wholesale uh, distributor mm -hmm. that handles all, all that stuff all that stuff for me. So if you're a retailer and you want to carry my products, yeah. then you just talk okay. to them and then they end up Yeah, because I know Tenacious, they, mm -hmm. they do work with a lot of, they help people kind of get off the ground. So I didn't know if you work directly with I, them. No, no uh, not directly. Okay. No. Just mm -hmm. curious. So that's pretty cool, though. I mean, to be able to have somebody to manage that piece of yeah, it. Yeah, so, for sure. I mean, could you imagine how many emails that would be, you know, trying well, to Well, yeah, I can because yeah. that's what I was <laughs> doing. Used to do it. Because I used to do it and yeah. I used to have all that inventory of all my products. Products, whether it was apparel, pins, patches, stickers, um, plush toys. Like, do you have any idea how, how much, like, yeah, a yes. plush toy this big, how many boxes that is, if you have 500 of them? Oh, yeah. It's, it filled my entire living room. So to say, you have a bed and then just merchandise. Yeah, that's I mean, how your house yeah, is. Yeah, pretty much. And so at a certain point, like, when you came to my house and you opened the front door, you would have to walk through, like, a maze <laughs> that's of right. boxes. Like, <laughs> The and old it, lady with the newspaper. Yeah, for right? sure. Yeah. It looked it's like it, it looked like I was like some crazy hoarder. And at a certain point, my girlfriend was just like, "Okay, dude, like, what is going on here? <laughs> like, what what are you doing with all this?" And I was like, "Okay." And it, and you know, to her credit, she was extremely supportive of like me doing that kind of thing. But it was really funny because when I finally signed with a wholesale distributor, like I signed with it on like a Friday, and on Monday she was like. 
okay, so like, when is this getting out of here? <laughs> Come on. And I was like, funny. I know, I know. <laughs> but you know, like doing the whole, the, you know, that's the other thing is that when you're self-producing stuff, you have to start act, like asking those questions of like, all right, well, like, what am I going to do with 500 units of plush toys? What am I going to do with 500 units of whatever this is? Like, where am I going to put it? How am I going to fulfill it? What am I going to pack it in? Like, blah, 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 How blah. is shipping going to be handled? Exactly, all you know, and it's, those are all questions I had to answer myself. And so I had to ask a lot of questions of everybody else that I knew that did this kind of stuff. And, and most of those people were very kind to be like, yes, these are, th- this is what I did and blah, 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 you know? And, but it's a struggle, dude. Like it's a struggle, especially coming from someone who like, I was like a fan of this type of stuff. And, and like I said, was working as an artist, but there's not like a manual, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Like even, even when you're like, you know, d- doing some deep Googling, it's like, there's no, there's no one source that says like, Oh, th- there, did you know there's like safety <laughs> codes in Ohio? If you want to sell plush toys? No. Like, you know, do you that have, doesn't matter. Yeah. You what? know, it's just like, you like, I never knew any of that stuff. I had to figure out all of it on my own, you know? Yeah. So, uh, and, and with every question answered, there's like five new questions, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that, yeah. that is true. So mm-hmm. as we close this out, um, what would the one piece of advice you would give to somebody who's out there that maybe has a design that wants to take this path? What's the fir- what's the best piece of advice you think you could give somebody? I mean, ask questions. That It's that simple. When I did my first plush toy, I was like, I want to make this toy. How do I do that? <laughs> you know <laughs> what I mean? Yeah, write it down. And, you know, and seriously, I had like a list of questions. And so that first question was, how do I do that? And I knew someone that made plush toys. And I said, how'd you do that? <laughs> she was like, she's like, oh, I used this company. And uh, I was like, cool, how'd you design it? And she's like, oh, like I sent them specs, blah, blah, blah. I was like, cool, uh, what'd you do that in? And she was like, oh, I did it in this. I was like, cool, and then what'd you do? <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and it's like, end? I asked questions. And you wrote a manual, is what you did. I, yeah, right? Well, I wrote my own manual pretty yeah. much, you yeah. know? And, and that's the thing is that everybody's kind of manual is different than one yeah. another. And one person's answers aren't gonna be the right answers for someone else. But like anytime anybody comes to me and they're like, hey, I'm trying to do this, like how, how, like what did you do? I try and answer them and I try and answer them honestly and I try and give them the same, the same experience and perspective that was given to me pretty freely. You know what I mean? Um, Cause it's not easy and it's hard to do it alone. And everybody should have the opportunity to kind of make this, you know, all the stuff they want to make and yeah. see if it works and see if it's cool and see if people like it, you know? Yeah. So yeah, so ask questions like it, cause I used to think doing this stuff was impossible. I used to think you needed a shit ton of money. I, you you need to know the right people. You need to like have the right contacts. And honestly, like that's only a little part of it. You know what I mean? Exactly. So ask questions. Like if you have something you want to do, figure out how to do it. You know? Yeah, that's great. Great advice. So uh, where can people find you? Social media, your website, all of the above. You can find me at 100 Soft on everywhere, and you can go to my shop at 100 Soft Shop. That shop. Yeah, that's yeah, it. Pretty simple. So thank you for taking time. For sure. To, to do this interview. It was very insightful for us. Cool. And I, I'm sure that our audience will love it. So uh, thanks again. And uh, until next time, I'm Rick. I'm Piper. I'm, I'm, I was truck. <laughs> Good night. See you later.